Hello, my name is Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Gelfoyle, I run Garden Masterclass. Now, Annie and I started Garden Masterclass uh, six years ago to put on live educational events uh, in the British Isles. Uh, but with um, COVID, uh, the lockdown in April 2020, uh, we started doing a public service broadcast. Uh, and then we've settled down to running both live events, uh, but also with a big online content. So we do this Thursday Garden Chat once a week on a Thursday evening, six o'clock um, Western European time. And those recordings then go up on to uh, YouTube. Now, we also do webinars. We have a webinar season that runs through from September to May. We get leading experts globally uh, from the garden and landscape world to talk about their specialism. And of course, that's an opportunity uh, to ask them questions. Most of those webinars are recorded and are then available uh, through Vimeo from our website. Uh, we also put on courses. Uh, there's a course on naturalistic planting design, for example, which I do with uh, Professor Nigel Dunnett of the University of Sheffield in, in Northern England. Uh, and uh, we sometimes get involved in organizing conferences. Uh, we do all sorts of things that are aimed at encouraging quality planting, quality gardening, uh, knowledge about plants and botany, and plant science. And uh, we hope you'll, you'll join us. Uh, we have a membership scheme which gives you discounts on our webinars and live events and various other goodies. Uh, and but also you can just sign up for our monthly email newsletter uh, to keep in touch with what we're doing. We believe and we've been told by many people that what we do is unique. It's unique in the range and quality of people we talk to and our global reach and our diversity. Uh, so I uh, hope you enjoy this particular episode and uh, do come back for more. We, we have a colleague in uh, in the Netherlands, Angela of Amadam, um, who uh, occasionally passes on to us um, names of um, people she thinks we should talk to. Unfortunately, Angela's um, busy this evening and can't uh, can't join us, which is a, a shame. But I'm sure she'll watch this recording. So thank you for, to Angela for introducing me to Norbert Peters, a man who describes himself as a botanic philosopher. Uh, basically, he teaches uh, at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, and um, so I think, first of all, Norbert, what is a botanic philosopher? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, so in, in Dutch, it's botanisch philosoph. And uh, I, I've sort of, when I started studying philosophy, I was very interested in the philosophy of biology, which was not necessarily a subject that you could take. But uh, I was very interested in that, and I sort of delved very deep into uh, animal behavior, uh, especially. And and when I finished my studies, I, I I was an assistant of a teacher who had a large garden arboretum uh, in in uh, in the northern part of the country in Groningen, and I mm. helped him a bit. I studied archaeology in the past, so I was well. I I could do measurements, etc. And he wanted to make a map of this garden with all these different trees in it and we started talking more and more about plants and we started you know having this idea we should write something about plants and philosophy and their role in philosophy because they are oftentimes i mean philosophy usually deals with human beings human cognition human ethics humans human behavior epistemology all these different subjects i mean the last decades we see it a lot more animal philosophy coming about as well. People thinking about, you know, the minds of animals, etc. And uh, I thought it was high time to also, you know, as a philosopher, pay more attention to botany and especially the history of, of botany as a science as well, how, how that is de has developed. And, and as a philosopher, I tried to look at the relationship between human beings and plants, also the relationship between plants themselves and with animals. And, and, and especially focusing on also on the question or maybe the main question would be what is a plant and how has that answer changed throughout the centuries? Um, so that really, that really interests me. Right, and now um, in our first contact, you, you, you mentioned that it was a book of mine that very quite early on got you interested in, in, in this topic, which was um, 
rather lovely to rather wonderful to hear was uh, this one here hybrid uh, the history and science of, of, of plant breeding so what was it about this book that um you know transformed your life <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was one of, I mean, of course, when you start to sort of venture into this new field of botany, I was, I was familiar with some natural history and some general natural history, geology, different, different fields of natural history, but, but plants, I was really not well versed in at all. And, and I, I, I think I just started to look for books and then based on those books and their bibliographies, look for other books. And, and I found hybrid and I was, I was already very interested in genetics and and mendel and 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 i mean in this history of, of botany there seemed to be a, quite a tight fit with i mean genetics breeding mm -hmm. uh, um uh, how do you say um um you know giving over uh, well I mean, yeah i think that these are tightly connected and mm -hmm. <clears throat> i think it was the first time i read about um hybrids being made already in the time of william shakespeare and featuring in winter's tale which i found a very nice story started reading winter's tale as well uh, with your with your book in mind and and i and i this was the, your, your book was the first one to introduce me to uh vafilo mm. uh, russian botanist agriculturalist who mm. i became very interested in and, and bought many many more books about him um it's just a very interesting character i mean thinking about the relationship between humans and plants i think he was a, a pioneer in that sense uh thinking about agricultural land races and the relationship between agriculture and human beings mm -hmm. also when it comes to weeds so 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 yeah your book was i think also an eye opener into many of the different fields in in, in botany that that sort of later on you know caught my interest even yeah. more and uh, started mm -hmm. researching even more great great now it's really 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 nice to hear that uh, you know can help people making these uh, these connections um so now um your latest um in publication involvement has been with um flora batava um, yeah. so can you tell us tell us about this definitely so i i I've, uh, I'll, I'll just hold up a copy which is quite it's a heavy book as you can see it's uh, yes it's 4 kilograms so it's uh, it's quite it's quite a big book i mean it's it's um so flora batava was a book series you could maybe call it very mm. similar to maybe um um the, the floras that were, were made of english uh, plants but also mm. france of course it started also in in a, in a sort of same period so it started in 1800 and it was a first attempt to in image and in words and especially also in 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 dutch uh also in french by the way but that's a different story but uh dutch descriptions uh, with images, the first time they started to make a catalog of all the plants that grew wild in the Netherlands. Mm. Started in 1800 and lasted until 1834, and mm. it, com it composed of, so it's 28 uh, uh, volumes, which is extensive considering that yes. many people think yeah. Netherlands doesn't really have a rich flora. Um, and and this is a, a, a reproduction of that. Of course, it's not 28 volumes now, mm. so. We've decided to only, well, mainly put the, Im the images in for uh, in one page, and then hundred uh, species we sort of lift up or we sort of put in the limelight. Uh, yeah. So these are on on actual scale with the text included, and we asked, I think it's sixty five other authors to select one or two plants and mm -hmm. and give a sort of new description, write a new essay about these plants, what what role they yeah. it plays in their in their lives. Mm -hmm. So it's like a sort of a. a partly a facsimile partly an update and a, yeah yeah yes yes correct yeah and i also wanted to show not only like we have a we have a quite a rich flora even though i mean i mean of course not com in comparison to maybe indonesia for instance but we yeah, do yes. have quite a rich flora but i also wanted to show like how how rich the all the people are that that you know that, that focus on flora not not just botanists or uh plant geographers or ecologists but also like many many other people artisans uh artists botanical illustrators uh mm. to also show like how many and you know, how many different ways people uh interact with plants and and, and sort of make plants their subject mm, mm, mm. yes so um and um however yeah there's there's those of us who who, who really engage with with plants and then there's the others who we feel are probably the majority of the population who seem to be um extraordinarily unaware of plants you know plants were kind of Greek green blur that's a backdrop to their lives um and in the you sent me various uh presentations of, of of things you've done um 
as a way of introducing me to your work. And one of the things, one of the one of the presentations was 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 headed curing plant blindness. Um, so perhaps could you explain what you mean by plant blindness? Yeah, of course. Um, so of course, this title was also selected to attract as yeah. many students as possible that also yes. don't have a background in, in botany, and also to 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 take them in a couple of classes. I think it was only six classes to give them a sort of general introduction into uh, into botany, but also into how botany ties into different fields that they might be more familiar with. Mm -hmm. So it was also to attract students. But of course, uh, I like plant blindness as a word. It was uh, just to give a short background. I'm not sure how familiar people are with the, with the term, but it was it was coined by James van der Zee and Elizabeth Schussler, two American botanist teachers who, who noticed amongst their students, amongst the staff, amongst the books that they read, that very little attention was oftentimes spent on botany. The, the group of students that you know uh, applied for botany was quite small. Um, I mean, in general, I mean, if you look at nature documentaries, you look at all different sorts of output when it comes to nature, I think plants often are sort of the backdrop. And there were some terms in, in, in circulation. So, so there was plant neglect, which I also quite liked, um, uh, and zoocentrism, sort of that mm -hmm. we focus too much on animals and i think in, in a sense i like the term in a sense i think it's problematic because as soon as you say plant blindness it raises all sorts of questions like we do see plants we can appreciate plants like most of us can appreciate a bouquet of flowers or a nice park etc um even even a non-botany minded people so it's a bit of a stretch you know it's not plant it's not blindness in, in the usual sense it's more like color blindness you can still see colors but some contrast is is, is lost um mm -hmm. And also it raised this question of, is there a cure, right? Because as soon as you say something is a sort of deficiency, then it also raised the question, mm -hmm. can we, and you say yes. you talk about yes. symptoms. But I think the main symptoms that they discuss is one that they, we don't really pay a lot of attention to plants. And uh, the second would be that we underestimate their value for, for the environment, for animals, mm -hmm. but also for our own existence. And that we hierarchically sort of rank them below humans, animals, and other creatures as very sort of passive, simple yes. organisms. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the reasons I think people are plant blind are, I think, are, are not very easy to sort of pin down. I think there is a part of bio biological evolutionary aspect to this. Um, so we tend to focus more on animal movement, for instance. Uh, we tend to be less aware of, of plants. I think this, this has evolutionary reasons as well. I mean, if we're looking into the world, we already make a sort of hierarchy of what grabs our notice and what we sort of leave, you know. Uh, uh, so, so in a sense, I think plants already are sort of a backdrop in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's also cultural and, and, and societal, you know, uh, uh, um, yeah, influences at work. So I think that when I talk to older generations, I often notice that people have a lot more plant knowledge, know a lot more plant names still. And people, you know, I'm from the city as well. When I, before I knew botany, I knew very little of plants as well. So, so I think it's also maybe our modern day existence a, a little bit, especially here in the Western world. And then there, I think there's also a philosophical layer to it where we talk more about, you know, if we, if we say we place plants hierarchically lower than animals, I think this is a sort of uh, a metaphor that was very powerful in, in philosophy of the ladder of nature, sort of, or the mm -hmm. great chain of being. I think this is a very powerful, has been a very powerful metaphor for hundreds or even thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, and only very recently, or maybe not so recently, I think with Darwin and, and other like-minded people, this sort of changed more into this tree-like view of nature and not, so, not so much this hierarchical stepped order of nature. And I think this has opened up possibilities maybe to also not view plants as passive and simple creatures, but to, mm -hmm. to regard them more highly. But mm -hmm. it is, of course, in a sense, also, that's just the progress of scientific thought. And it's also the progress of philosophical thought when it comes to yeah. plants. So mm -hmm. Linnaeus would be considered by James Van der Zee and Elizabeth Schuchler to be plant blind because he, for instance, didn't notice cross-pollination mm -hmm. or he didn't notice photosynthesis. Um, but of course, that's a bit silly to say because Linnaeus is the biggest botanist we sort of had uh, in yes. history. Mm, so I mm. think it also deals with, and I think I like this idea in, in philosophy. Uh, if you take, for instance, Ludwig Wittgenstein, a language philosopher, he talks about aspect blindness. So the blindness for a certain aspect of a thing, 
Like mm. you can look at a plant, but you can still be blind to certain aspects that it aspects that it has. And in in this progress of science, you also see that different. You know, you come to view plants, a different aspect of plants. For instance, carnivorous plants. Before Darwin, people did not really believe that to be carnivorous plants, or maybe only a few. So that that takes a bit of a different way of looking at at plants. That uh, as long mm -hmm. as you think that animals eat plants and that's the only way natural order is, then, mm -hmm. then you run into trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, obviously this is not hardwired into humans. I mean, so many oh. hunter-gatherer societies, uh, there must be, majority of the population must have a very intimate knowledge of, of the plants that they, they can eat or the plants that might poison them or the plants that might cure them. You know, it's part and parcel of, much more part and parcel of their, of their, of their life. Um, and um, yeah, it, it uh, it's interesting you were saying about uh, people not um, historic botanists not actually understanding photosynthesis or, or asking the right questions. I mean, to me, it's absolutely amazing that it wasn't really until Camerarius in the sort of late 16th century who realized that flowers were about sexual reproduction. Um, yeah. That I, I suppose part of this is perhaps tied up with this very, you know, Christian worldview, whereby everything is assumed to be designed for for the um, the enhancement of the, the life of, of, of human beings, um, but uh, that that again is one of those things. They, well, actually, what are I they... think also uh, Aristotle was very very influential yeah. in that sense. Was mm -hmm. real yes, authority. Yes. And Aristotle sort of said, like, so for sexual reproduction, you need to be able to move to locate to mm -hmm. locomote to to. Yes. I mean, at least one of the two has to reach the other. Um, mm -hmm. So he also sort of dismissed this whole idea, and 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 um, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's very strange to me as well. It was such a late discovery, and then cross pollination was even a later discovery. Eighteenth century yes. really became popular in the nineteenth century, even though it's mm -hmm. so obvious, right? We we and we have bees for so long to gather nectar, so. It's so strange to to think um, that we looked very differently at flowers a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, although one does wonder whether that's a, a cultural thing. I mean, just thinking about the the Arab world, where there was a a, a, a clear understanding of the fact that date palms are male and female. And yeah, we, yeah. Everyone yeah. knew that. So one wonders, in fact, whether you know Arab classical Arab uh, civilization botany might have might have made a bit more of an advance there. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, one of the things that uh, you, you seem to have an interest in, which um, you have an, an interest in 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 wildness, um, and I, as someone who has been a fairly frequent visitor to the Netherlands and has actually you know written a book about Dutch gardens and, and, and landscapes. I'm very aware of this particular kind of dialectical relationship the Dutch have with 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 nature and wildness. That in this you know, this most manufactured and controlled of all countries, uh, there is this strong ecological and and and, and uh, uh, ecological movement and, and conservation movement. And there's recreations of wild habitats, which are, you know, extraordinarily uh, su su successful. And there seems to be these sort of two, two poles in, 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 in Dutch society between the sort of total engineered control of the landscape and uh, something much more in, in balance with, with, with nature. Um, I mean, do you think this, this is a particularly the, the, the background you're interested in wildness, is, is this this particularly unique Dutch relationship, do you think? Uh, I think it's a, yeah, it's a bit Dutch, it's a bit American, I think. So mm -hmm. so I, I sound a bit like an American. My dad lived in the United States for a long yeah, time. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, um, so, so yeah, then we tie into a bit of a different field. So I was very into botany, writing a lot about botany. I was also interested in gardens and garden philosophy and, and, um, and, and this wilderness theme, this sort of came about because I, I, I joined a Dutch translation of one of the last essays of Henry David Thoreau, uh, a oh, sort of mm. pioneer when it comes to yes. wilderness thinking. Um, very, very influential. Strangely enough, also quite influential in the 19th century. Nowadays, not so much, but in the 19th century in, in, in Holland, uh, in, in the oh, Netherlands. Oh, really? Oh, really? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. we, we even have a small colony or commune that was uh, that was called Walden, inspired by uh, Gosh, really? wow. uh, Thoreau's retreat, uh, his two-year retreat at the, at Walden Pond in, uh, in Massachusetts. Oh. We oh, had gosh. a Dutch writer, uh, Frederik van Ede, 
uh, who was a very influential writer who started this commune when he was reading Thoreau's book, uh, he sort of imagined this as well, that this idea of, you know, you need to uh, go away out of industrialized society and start yeah, your own yeah. way of mm -hmm. uh, living. Um, uh, so, okay. so when I was about, reading... Around about when, when, was, when was that, that commune? So this is end of the 19th century. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But also our first, uh, our first sort of uh, nature conservation pioneer, Jacques P. Thijssen, who, of course, who, yes. who mm -hmm. saved the, the Naardermeer, also mm. read Thoreau quite extensively, and uh, oh. and in a certain sense, you could say a, a, a nature monument. As, as, that's the the nature monument, and this is the organization he started, Nature's yeah. Monuments, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, with this idea, you know, we already are saving architectural monuments. We should save natural monuments, or we should treat natural monuments in a very same way. Uh, we should we should you know, uh, they, I mean, they wanted to make the Nardamir into a, a garbage dump. For Amsterdam, yeah, yeah, it yeah. was a beautiful, beautiful lake. Mm -hmm. uh, still is, uh, and and it's very. Uh, it's even a little bit. Uh, you can compare it a little bit to Walden Pond. There's also a, tr a train track running sort of right across it. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, similar yeah. to Walden Pond in uh, in Massachusetts. But mm -hmm. I became interested in this idea of wilderness, and I think you're correct. And you know, God made the world, and the Netherlands was made by by the Dutch themselves, as they as they oftentimes say. So I think we have maybe as one of the first nations to have a bit of a problematic relationship with nature conservation, mm -hmm. uh, losing so much nature in the 19th yes. century, uh, big, big movements to rationalize the country, to get rid of the final wildernesses, wilderness areas, mm -hmm. uh, and to sort of make this into farmland. You know, this was very much the 19th century goal. And, and we yes. started losing many, many, many of our forests and dune reserves and all these other beautiful places, beautiful mm -hmm. wild plants. And, and wild animals, and and I think that that sort of spearheaded maybe this this movement a bit of um, mm -hmm. we need to we need to safeguard nature, um, but I think nowadays it's even stranger that we also spearheaded this new movement of rewilding, or at least we were maybe one of the first countries to rewild an area. Mm -hmm. Oostharders lost a very controversial area. We have a couple of uh, country debates that appear every year. Uh, I think it's mm. true. The same is true for almost every country. But one of our debates, uh, is especially when there's the seasons culling, uh, we we again debate this Oostvaarders uh, yes. because it's, mm. a, it's it is a controversial area in a certain sense. It's also a mad idea in a certain sense. But mm. um, yeah, I think this became very popular because we're such a densely populated country. And yes. um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think, I mean, as some philosophers have said similar things that. Uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, value for wild wilderness or aesthetic appreciation of wilderness really starts in places where there is no wild left, right? Uh, uh, yes, the city, yes. for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps you better explain what the Otvasa Plassen is for those who've um, not heard about it before. Uh, sorry about? Could you explain about the oh, yeah, yeah. Plassen and exactly what it is uh, in case something we might have? Yeah, yeah. That's, that. that's yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. So, so. Uh, if you look at old maps of the Netherlands, there, there's, a, there's a middle section, there was sort of an inner sea a bit, yeah. uh, reaching mm -hmm. also Amsterdam, the Zuiderzee, as it was called, and uh, this was later sort of diked off in the north, became a more of a sweet water lake, and they, they made this new land, Flevoland, which was mm -hmm. an agricultural dream, right? Uh, you have old newspaper articles saying, you know, there, there's not a plant in sight, you can just go, you know, there, you can, mm -hmm. this is just a arable field right arable fields as yes, far as the yes. eyes, uh, eyes can see uh, but there were sections of Flevoland that were pr more problematic um uh with the water uh, with water management and there was one section that they sort of designated as an industrial site uh, mm. not, not too long ago i think in the 60s 70s i'm not sure i'm not i'm not mm. i'm not a specialist in in the osar cluster so i know it just as an onlooker but from what i've read is that um so it was uh, it was hard to manage the water levels, or at least mm -hmm. it was sort of partially submerged. So they couldn't really do any industry there or put any industry there. And then many birds flock there as as breeding grounds or as 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 uh, grazing grounds. So many special birds came to this Oostvaarders blossom, and um, then it was noticed by ecologists, uh, and especially the ecologist Frans Vera, uh, who sort of you know tried to. I think it was him who tried to protect this. A uh, piece of land, and had this idea to rewild it, to stock it with um, large herbivores, 
which he mm. thought were missing in the Dutch landscape, and he thinks uh, hold a very sort of pivotal place in the ecology of the Dutch landscape, uh, and also had so in the past before the arrival of humans. So he had this idea, this dream, and uh, he mm. bought, you know, quite a lot of um, heck. Uh, uh, um, cattle and he bought some uh, some different uh, deer from, from of course from other places other countries brought them to the Oostfires Plus and released them there and uh, well they had a bit of a maltusian um, trouble ever since because of course there's also no predator so and mm -hmm. this is very fertile ground so so these the, the, these uh, herds are uh, multiplying in quite a fast uh, fast mm -hmm. way and because of this multiplication, of course, you also saw, saw starvation in the winter. And, and mm -hmm. this sort of was when the first protests were heard of yeah. people that this was really not something that you should be doing in the mm -hmm. Netherlands. And that sort of became a na nationwide discussion. Like, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. people oftentimes don't like nature when it's red in tooth and claw. We yes, like nature yes. when it's chir birds chirping and uh, um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the wolves haven't made it across there yet then? No, it's quite hard. Also, I think it would be, well, I mean, they would have to open it up more, I think. So it's quite closed off. You can even, you can take a train and you can run by it and you can sort of see, you can see it for yourself. Uh, uh, tourists yeah. are oftentimes struck by this sort of strange image of, you know, you have the Netherlands, all these sweet little canals and meadows and cows, etc., and uh, fields full of tulips and uh, and whatnot. And uh, then all of a sudden you have this sort of almost Serengeti-like yeah, <laughs> landscape yeah. with uh, mm -hmm. with wild uh, um, with wild herds roaming about, uh, which is quite a strange sight, as you can well, yes. well imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. And of course, this was one of the first examples of what um you know what was called rewilding and, and the term rapidly seems to have been completely devalued you know people are talking about rewilding re their you know their postage stamp gardens or rewilding their window boxes um it, it does seem to be in a, a word and i think originally it was actually a really very useful concept in terms of you know big areas of land less letting go and 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 yeah, particularly with, as you say, with with the larger mammals, uh, allowing them them free reign. Um, yeah, I I view it to be quite problematic. That's more from a philosophical standpoint. I mean, I I enjoy these these areas. I mean, I have not visited many rewilded areas, but yes. I can I can definitely find the allure, the aesthetic allure. Um, it's just that I my problem lies mostly with um, uh, what is our position in this rewilding and what does rewilding mean right uh it really depends on our what, what we think is wilderness and and mm. and this is one of the other classes i teach at at, at school is what, what is wilderness wilderness in the anthropocene it's called but you know it's really about this question what is wilderness and thoreau was one of the first ones to sort of shout from the rooftops how great wilderness was but he understood wilderness to be a place devoid and untouched pristine uh mm. place uh untouched by modern civilization uh you know as they viewed Amer uh, large parts of America and in North America, th this became very problematic, this wilderness idea, especially, mm -hmm. you know, currently, uh, but also there was this great wilderness debate. And I mean, many people criticize this idea, you know, America was not a wilderness when the first European settlers came. Uh, it was actually widely populated by even agricultural societies. Yes, very, yes. I mean, uh, so, and I think this, 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 but we still hold on to this idea of wilderness as this, pristine place devoid yeah. of human influence and i think this is also hurting rewilding a bit mm. i'm not really necessarily fond of nature where you as a human are not allowed in i think this is a very romantic notion of nature uh, yes, which yes, is also yes. also a bit i find it to be a bit not so much dangerous but weird right because i mean what is our place in nature i think if, as soon as we see ourselves as a sort of pollutant mm. that needs to that we need to of course, I very much understand that you want to rewild a place in a sense that you want to bring back natural eco, a natural ecosystem and natural ecosystem roles. I can understand that reasoning, uh, but I, 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 I fear it's too ideologically mm -hmm. uh, when, when you say wilderness, when you define wilderness as a, a place devoid of human beings. I think mm -hmm. if you define it like that, then the earth is, has no wilderness left. I mean, everywhere even the tiniest influences are felt. I mean, even in Antarctica, the atmosphere in Antarctica yes. is also un, a little bit under our influence as well. So 
then there would be no wilderness on earth left. And I think this is dangerous yes. for nature conservation. If you start yeah, to define yeah, nature yeah. as something that's no longer of this earth, then what, what are we going to protect, right? Yes, this yes. Is, uh, no, I yeah, think yeah. there's been a tendency amongst ecologists who do tend to be a singularly kind of purist crowd uh, yeah. that you can only talk about ecology in the context of, you know, what are defined as native plants. And as soon as you have uh, non-native species, they they lose interest. They deny that it's an, that it's an ecosystem, which, of course, is, is nonsense. Uh, nonsense. And the fact is that, as you say, with our changes to world, and particularly with the massive changes that are going to happen with climate change, that you know, yeah. novel ecosystems will be the only ones left. So you know, yeah. we got to we got to wise up and uh, and and uh, uh, you know, deal with that. Recognize novel ecosystems that are, that actually do have multi, that in fact are beneficial for biodiversity, um, as opposed to as opposed to those that those that aren't and. and you know, look at them much more seriously. You know, novel ecosystems are actually the future of nature. I, I, I think. I would think so too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think so too. And I, and we can get maybe more into that later on. But it's also there's also this danger in talking about native plants and exotic plants. I mean, there's there is some that's not necessarily valueless. These are not words. I mean, these are these are uh, burdensome words, or how do you say cumbersome words to yes. to use. Native mm. exotic, this, 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 even this polarity is is quite strange. But, mm. but my main, yeah, I think my main critique. So when I, I during Corona times, I wrote an essay about the Fundal Park and about this idea of wilderness. Yes. And my my main uh, problem was that there is also some, somewhat of an identity shift with nature conservation is dealing with rewilding. So mm. I view rewilding as as a new form of garden art, you could say. Right. Yes. As, yes. As we have. Mm -hmm. had garden art in the past, uh, formal gardens and English landscape gardens. I think this is a, and I think it's especially, it's a bit of a, well, you, I think you can call it a sibling of the landscape, uh, the, the landscape gardens that also yes, had yes. this main focus or this main idea, if I understand correctly. I mean, there's many people here that probably know a lot more about gardens than I do, but one of the main ideas, I think, are philosophy. Piece of, of the landscape garden was to hide your artificialness, to to yes, to yes. make it such that what you've made had this impression of nature on you, left this impression of nature. You know, you didn't prune your trees. I mean, of course, there was very many art uh, artificialities in in these English gardens, temples, bridges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that the main idea was to to hide this artificiality, to 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 give this impression of nature, and and uh, and, and I think. Yeah, that's yeah. sorry to interrupt, yeah. but actually going back to the Ostwasserplatz and the classic English landscape garden, or, or actually more correctly, park, had an awful lot of you know fairly large herbivores in it, um, and that was part of the part of the conceit. You know, the large herbivores would come up very close to your house and presumably would yeah. be hunted or shot every now and again for a bit of bit of uh, bit of venison. Um, and yes, so it's um, there's yeah more yeah quite a quite a similarity really yeah. Yeah, and I and I think also a a bit of a danger that they don't real necessarily. So usually rewilders say no old school nature conservationists yes. that cons conserve you know the, the nature reserves we we know and love in the Netherlands today. These yeah. are gardeners. Um, we are not gardeners. But also when you find if you look at it, and I think this is the problem with the re in rewilding. Like rewilding is a callback to something. Mm -hmm. It's a call. It, it has a relationship to the past. You want yes. to like it's you know almost similar to make America great again. I think this re is you know make mm. something wild again, again, yes. right? So it used to be wild and wasn't for. I, but it's, but it's the rediscovery of Eden. It's this endless need societies have to believe that you know once upon a time there was a golden age, whether it's the Garden of Eden or an ancient matriarchy or yep. you know or or or, or, or whatever. That uh, it's almost like we don't have enough confidence in our own ideas and our ability to. Uh, shape our, our future we have to sort of m make some some reference to some idealized notion of the of the past which as you say is a very uh, very uh, romantic one um, and this and allows you to garden i mean this allows you to manipulate nature because yes. then you say i'm bringing it back to how it used to be so this allows me to do all sorts of things introduce mm -hmm. new plants introduce animals uh, change the landscape in a very dramatic and costly way um mm -hmm. And I and I think that's where they 
don't see that they're gardening that that that, that in in doing so that this is also i mean it's a of course it's a garden where it's more of a laissez-faire garden and more yeah. of a you know we 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 bring back the situation and then we leave it uh, and and see and see what happens and study yeah. it but i mm -hmm. think it's a, it's i think it's a it's a deeply it's a it's a, yeah i think it's a new strain of garden art that we don't yeah. necessarily identify it as garden art just yet yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um and we got a couple of comments coming in <clears throat> um going back to the, the plant bindness uh, diana uh, saying in our schools they teach us about plants as a living thing that we study so we can benefit from them they don't teach us how to take care of them uh caring for them is something more likely to be transmitted by our families uh, and Ulla um saying you can only see what you know about as long as there's no education of practical botany or plants at school many young people will not have any chances to build up relations to plants and understanding uh Biology yeah. often cut due to lack of teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, too, too true. Um, and also lack of lack of knowledge amongst teachers oftentimes yes. too. I mean, yes. I really like the old schools that still did a herbarium with students. And I, right. I think it's yeah. also very much about telling stories about plants. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, stories are such an important tool in this as well. I think I agree, especially also with the caring part try to take care of a plant keep it alive yes. see what happens you know mm -hmm. and study it study it what lives yes. on it lives near it i mean that's so important yeah yeah mm -hmm. um now you 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 mentioned the, the the vondel park which i only have a very very dim memory of um and, that was uh, mine all <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, a long long time ago since i was about, I was about 20 i think and i think involved uh, um local yes uh, the famous dutch joints were um, possibly involved um but i only seem to remember it as, as a vague um as a vague park um, i'm much more familiar with the parks at amstel vein which were very much in the tradition of jack taser who you mentioned earlier um and in fact i think just before christmas we had a um a uh, one of these uh, conversations with a, a young american guy keenan porter who would uh, spent six months in the netherlands specifically studying um uh hame, hame parks um and um so we've 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 sort of heard about them i mean the the, the parks at amstel Vane, they are you know like a very to me they come across as a very kind of stylized nature and overwhelmingly native plant species and very cleverly managed but um uh, where are where are they for you in your sort of wildness culture spectrum the, 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 and then you mean the Vondel Park, or yeah, I'm not the, yeah, the, yeah, no, yeah. It's more the the, the Hame Parks with that, uh, like Amstel. Oh, Hame. the Hame Park, yeah. Mm. I mean, yeah, that I mean that deals with. So, so I'm I'm also doing in uh, a PhD research into the origins of uh, invasive exotics, not necessarily yeah. when yeah. they start to become invasive, but more this mm. this idea, this thinking of when we did we start to think of in terms of exotic versus native or mm. foreign versus native. And when we did, we start to think in terms of invasing, you know, yes, uh, plants yes. or apples in invasing. And I think this this hame town, this sort of uh, um, this idea that you build a garden and you only keep native plants. Um, well, I see this sometimes in nature conservation as well, in the way that we that we treat uh, exotics, especially so-called invasive exotics. Uh, I think also sometimes the goal almost seems to be to have a hame town as the ne the Netherlands as a hame town. You know, to have this 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 country that only only holds native plants. And and yeah. I think you, as you said correctly, we are living in a novel ecosystem, especially here in the Netherlands, especially yes, also in yes. cities. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at city plants and you really look at their origins, so many plants are from the Mediterranean, from South America, from oh, New yes. Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Asia. So we are dealing with a novel ecosystem. So, so I'm always a bit hesitant of this this over. Um, how do you say this? Over to, placing too much significance on uh, being native mm. uh, versus being exotic, mm. because I think it's um, you know it also deals. Well, I mean you. It, 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 the, I mean sometimes you talk to ecologists about it, and oftentimes these are nature loving people. These are not people that are politically under right spectrum or they're mm. not very conservative necessarily but when it comes to nature they can be quite ve you know vehemently yeah, yes. against uh, mm. exotics mm. and invasive exotics 
Yeah, I you, think, you see that. You, I mean, you see that a lot in the United States, and much less so in Europe. I mean, the, the issues in, in the United States, it has to be said, are actually very, very different. Um, but no, there, there is mm-hmm. that sort of um, yes, kind of. And we moved about plants so much, so I, yes. and I think that we only started noticing that we moved plants so much by the 18th and the 19th century, mm-hmm. and and it only became more and more and more. I think it's a bit of a wishful thinking to to only want to have native plants in the country, especially in our day and age. I mean, we yes. have harbors, we have airports, we have well, airports are not necessarily such a big problem, but so many plants are on the move because of us, yes. Uh, yes. consciously yes. or unconsciously, that mm. it would be very difficult to, keep, yeah, to keep it all native. And also, so this is this is what I, that's why I sometimes think at hang time is a bit, problematic so i, I yes, like yes. to also show love to exotic plants i think they also play a very important role in our society and and i think um <clears throat> I, I mean and i also even this invasive this notion of invasiveness i i, I take i take very critical or I, I try to take a very critical look at it i mean of course i want mm-hmm. to be remain objective and also to see how it developed that's my main interest but mm-hmm. i'm also critical in in, in using it uh, mm-hmm. What I see when I look at history is that some of what we've called invasive exotics have been invasive only for a very short period of time. Yes, mm-hmm. and and, uh, and, um, and and that's usually because we set the scene. We set the yeah, scene yeah, for yeah. for them to to be able to be invasive because yes, we yes. emptied out our ecosystem so much. And mm-hmm. then, of course, maybe the most important idea, or maybe the most important part, is in order to be an exotic, you need to be introduced by human beings, and this places human beings outside of natural uh, mi- migration of plants, yes, which yes. I find strange, especially mm. because we ourselves, I mean, if you talk about a species that has invasive properties and uh, has the exactly. ability, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is yeah. always what strikes That's me as right. odd. Yeah. You know, we're very a much a certain, amount of, certain not amount, amount of hypocrisy here. Yes, yes. A bit, what about right? weeds? Yeah. I think we're at a time at the moment where there's quite a sort of bit of a definition of of weeds. I mean, there's always been a bit of a tendency amongst kind of, you know, hippie garden writers to book, write books with titles like, you know, learn to love your weeds. Um, but it's recently the um, the Royal Horticultural Society have been sort of trying to sort of def- redefine words like weeds and pets and diseases, um, s- sometimes to a level that all- almost seems a bit uh, a bit absurd. And there was a rather daft piece by uh, a g- British garden journalist, Alice Fowler, in the in the the Guardian a few weeks ago, sort of saying that we shouldn't even call brambles weeds. Well, I mean, that, you know, was wonder whether she ever does any gardening. I mean, there are certain. Certain species, and well, what brambles are absolutely totally North European natives, but uh, you know their growth is absolutely inimical to uh, to, to to any other kind of kind of gardening. Um, do you have a, a position on how we you know, how we uh, might redefine weeds, or wh- where is where is a useful category for deciding where weed ends and, and begins? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested, especially the last couple of years with weeds. I mean, I'm dealing a little bit with it in my PhD research. I, I, I think invasive exotics are a new weedy care category, um, mm-hmm. but also in a more general sense. I'm, so, my, yeah, I'm, I'm still in the process of writing, but I'm very much writing a lot about uh, weeds nowadays. So I, I, I have much to tell, but I'll so so in a sense, I, I, I think you're right. So I, I. Of course, it's strange to call something a weed because there is always this relational aspect to it. There's mm. no weeds without us human beings, right? So yeah. yes, yes. We we need one another in a, in a sense. You could even say that we, even though we dislike weeds, they're cultural followers. They mm. follow mm. us. They mm. they camp, like camp to followers. grow yes. in our vicinity. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> they they very much like us. Uh, we we don't like them as much, but I think we all are also underestimating the, the the power of weeds. I mean, mm. I think you're correct in saying talking about the bramble but also if you talk to agriculturalists if you let certain uh weeds go on your fields mm. i mean you're i In mean big your trouble. problem yes. would be yes. just so dramatically decreased if you do mm. nothing so yes. to say there's no such thing as a weed i'm always a bit hesitant yeah. uh, yes. Yes. i think yes. it's a changing subject it's a changing mm. term but we do need to look at what does it mean to to call something a weed so oftentimes and i think one of the main definitions that usually is given, even though there's many definitions. And like weed, also the word weed is very weedy that in the sense that it can be really contained. But um, mm. one of the definitions I like is uh, to say the weed is a plant in the wrong place. 
But that, yes, of course, yes. already, you know, it starts you with two questions, like what is wrong and what is place, right? And yes. uh, of, oftentimes this question has been answered that the place is our garden <laughs> or our city. And, mm -hmm. and wrong is that we have designated this spot for something else and something yes. has spontaneously occurred. Mm -hmm. But I and think Dan in later years, up, Yeah, Diane has flagged up that in Spanish, weeds are called mala yerba, and the same in Portuguese, malas ervas. You know, that we're actually mala bad. We're using this very, very normative language. Um, and actually, oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in well, Dutch, it's unkraut, which is also means yeah, yes, very mm. bad uh, curbs. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. So we, the, the the English weed then is actually a re relatively neutral term then. Um, yeah, and know? it's related to the Dutch wieden, which is taking away weeds. So oh, to weed right. is mm. actually has a, or and I'm, I'm not sure how etymologically how they are connected, but wieden mm -hmm. and weed are are yes. are connected. I you can, and until the 18th century, we could say wiet in in Dutch as well, which is actually now also known as marijuana. Not, not in the 18th century, uh, you could spell yeah. something unkraut or wheat uh, yes. as, as a, but now it's only reserved for marijuana. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which is yeah. also interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure, particularly in the Dutch context. Um, yes, so I mean, personally, I've always regarded weeds as being very much on a, on a gradient, uh, that things that are, uh, might be a, a weed in the vegetable garden might be perfectly acceptable for a certain amount of time elsewhere and I think particularly now that I'm gardening in Portugal where the vast majority of spontaneous plants stroke weeds are in fact annuals and therefore very much easier to deal with than uh, the sort of tenaciously rooted perennials I had to deal with in 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 the west of, of England um, does actually make it much more you know the whole business of what a weed is is, is is a much more kind of subtle business and a lot of them are actually very attractive and there's always things you can Know, let grow until they begin to seed and then and then and then pull them out to to, to manage them um, and um so you at the moment you well you're quite keen i think to talk about darwin you've done quite a bit of work on on darwin darwin is a botanist yeah, Darwin is a botanist. Yeah, yes. Uh, so this was my debut. So after I finished the book with my teacher uh, called "Plantliness" or "Plant Aarde" in in in, the, yes. in, in Dutch, uh, I, I, yeah, my debut was on the botanical works of Charles Darwin, which I I think showcases another small small piece of plant blindness. Is that we? Oh, Darwin is one of I think one of the only scientists we know more than one fact about. Usually, it's you know Archimedes and uh, the bathtub and yes, yes. Know, the <laughs> Benjamin yes, Franklin. Yes, yeah. But with Darwin, it's quite a lot more often. Even if even if people are not very well versed in in in, in Darwinian sort of history, but mm -hmm. even even they know the Galapagos Islands or the Finches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yes, et cetera. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But w one third of his work was focused on plants, and even in his other work, there's quite a lot of plants, even in the Origin of Species. And he talks so much about plants and, and, and also in his early travels, also on the Galapagos Islands. He was very, very focused on, on plants. And I think his, his corpus on plants is, was maybe so important or could be deemed so important. Of course, there's many other plants, physiologists mm -hmm. and plant scientists working at, in the 19th century doing amazing work. But um, I think he, because plants for him were such an important subject to understand evolution, and also ecology later on, he really became well-versed in botany. I mean, and I like more his second part of his life, not so much his beagle voice, but him staying, you know, in the, in the, in, in the country and working and experimenting with plants. And he wrote about carnivorous plants, climbing plants, orchids, uh, flower pollination. He was one to popularize cross-pollination as an idea and to give it a firm scientific uh, uh, foundation. Um, mm. But also, I mean, just, uh, I mean, the habits of plants and, and, and what I think was most striking or is his most important book when it comes to plants is The Power of Movement in Plants, yes, where he yeah. shows in very crude ways with crude experiments, time-lapse images of plants mm -hmm. moving about mm -hmm. and yes. spearheading this idea of plants are always on the move mm -hmm. and plants are not just moving, but they're even... Uh, sensitive of their surroundings, they pick up on cues. They are uh, perceptive of their surroundings. And actually, they, they make decisions, don't they? Yeah, they make decisions. I mean, mm. he started, one third of that book is devoted to the rootlet or the first root that, that pops out of the seed. Radical, yeah. The radical, yeah. And, and, and just 
trying to understand what all the different environmental cues these radicals are using in order to navigate through the underground and trying yeah. to visualize that and also trying to experiment yeah. with yes. that. Yes, mm -hmm. It's such mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. I mean, he really struck me as a, as, as a person that, and, and I think that's where you also come into sort of botanical philosophy a bit. Of course, he was a very important scientific figure and he of course saw himself very much as a scientific figure, but I think he also really changed how we look at plants, that we began mm -hmm. to see plants as spontaneously moving, interacting, like somebody mm -hmm. read in the comments as well, like really to view them as living beings, as organized, uh, complex beings that we should not just simply dismiss as, oh, these are crude organisms yes, yes. and mm -hmm. weird complex ones, but really trying to decipher their, their life. And, and, and it's such a strange thing to me that it took us so long to, for instance, to find photosynthesis or so long to, to understand cross-pollination yes. that, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's one of the wonderful things he, he did for us is to open our eyes to, to those sites of plants that we really didn't have any, any attention for, um, yeah, or any, yeah, yeah, yeah. any interest yes. in. Mm, mm, mm. Um, question from James Golden, whether you've published anything in English, <laughs> whether there might be any possibility of that happening. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. I, as a writer, uh, I mean, it, it's always very nice to write in your in your mother's tongue. I mean, because mm -hmm. so usually the, the language you're most well versed in. Um, so I, I've read most things. Most of my things are are are, are written in are written in Dutch. I have mm -hmm. a couple of like English chapters or English shorter pieces in English. If anybody is interested, we can you know I can give them my email address and I can send some things that. I have yeah. written in English or things that have been translated, but I should, um, well, this is one of my, I mean, I hope to have enough time in, 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 in the future to, to also at least try to translate them myself or, or, yeah. or have them translated. Yes. Um, you know, it's always a dream, but it's also, also you have to find the time. Um, yes, uh, yeah. yes. And, and, and tra translation. You know, is, is an expensive business. I mean, I mentioned mentioned at the beginning of this. You know, we've got this, uh, you know, Polish franchise, and uh, you know, once you've paid an interpreter or translator, you know, there's sort of there's, there's 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 no money left. And uh, I mean, no doubt the algorithms are working away and improving all the time. So, I dare say that situation may 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 change. Great. Um, no, okay. Translating well, is a, yeah yeah, yeah. No, another another whole subject. Yes. Um, Great. Well, thank you very much. That was a, an interesting discussion. Um, and um, we'll, um, yeah, maybe we'd uh, look to get you back for something one day. I mean, maybe we should uh, even uh, run some of your, your presentations over the over the winter. That might be, um, then at least that would give people more of a, an opportunity to hear what you've, you've got to say. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of, I do teach in English quite a lot. Yes, so I, yes. I, I I have quite a lot of classes on the birth of ecology yeah. and and, yes. and 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 the birth of of, of botany. But I'd be lovely. Uh, we'd lovely yeah. to share. But, but that, also, that, thank that, you very much for talking to talking about. Yeah, great, good. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, and um, thanks for coming this evening, everybody. And and um, one day, perhaps when I next make it to the Netherlands, we'll we'll meet up. Hopefully so. Okay. Yeah. And thank you very much for the invitation. Okay. I really enjoyed. Uh, well, talking to you in 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 person. Uh, yeah. I just know you from your book, so that was that was quite a quite an honor uh, yeah. to be interviewed by, by you. Thank you. Great. Thank Bye. you. Bye.